Greetings, ladies and mentorants, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space, where I take stories from across the internet and read them for your entertainment. This story is growing at a rapid pace because of you guys, and we're going to hit the 100,000 barrier pretty soon. But we still need to push on a little further. If you guys don't mind, pop a little UFO emoji down in the description. Hit the like button so hard that it'll orbit the sun faster than the planet. And if you're not subscribed and you do enjoy this content, please hit the subscribe button. Anyways, on to the story. The Otters Meet a Human by Farmwitch4275 Our proudest, greatest moment had gone horribly wrong. The mission had started so beautifully. A perfect launch, a perfect orbital entry, and we managed to gather more data about our bright blue home in the void than we'd ever hoped. Launch, take some photos to use the base satellite, whip ourselves around our closest moon, then head back home. It was during the preset up phase for the moonshot where everything went wrong. Pressure warning spiked suddenly, blowing one of our thrusters off. Our command pod, or rather, what was left of it, careened out of control some 200,000 clicks away from safety. We panicked and tried our best to stabilize the craft as best we could, and eventually we did. Our ordeal, however, had only just begun. Soon, we faced more failures as we were forced to ditch damaged components to lighten up our trajectory and to try to save what little fuel we had. Seven hours after we started, we realized there was no hope. There was no fuel left for a bone strong enough to get us home, and even if there was, the parachute hatches had failed, meaning even if we got back home, we would be incinerated or turned into a crater. I looked at my fellows in the command box. I was so proud of them, of us. We had come so far. Lieutenant Lorid, Lieutenant Byrod, and Flight Lead Gruber. My fellow artists, from digging burrows in the ground to flying in space. So, uh, looks like this is it, huh? I looked at my friends with a half smile. Never thought that I'd go out like this, Cap, but uh, what a way to go. Byrd looked back at me with a smile. He snarled, twitching with a mix of excitement and fear. I don't care what's out there. Look at it, it's so beautiful. Lieutenant Laura chuffed his long, flattened tail, betraying his demeanor, as he slipped between his legs in fear. Yeah, it's glorious, my commandant. I fixed the Zyro, at least, so uh, at least we can reorient for the trip home, Gruber said as his claws tapped away at the keyboard. The radio clackered and splattered at us. Oh, don't tell me the radio's failed now. I'm on it, Cap, Bard exclaimed and snaked his way through the cockpit. Gruber moved away, his slender body and short legs giving plenty of space. As if we did not have enough problems, I will check the rest of the electronics. Same. Maybe I can see if the EVA airlock will hold. I can go outside and see if we can do repairs. Lorette clutched his webbed feet at the door and carefully examined it. I got to work as well. Perhaps I can see how to stabilize the load between the thrust modules. The radio clackled loudly again. A voice erupted from it. It was in a strange language, or at least spoken very broken and very otterish. There is a signal coming in, main commandant. It's not from home. Perhaps they're having difficulties communicating or trying to bounce the signal off a satellite. Try to see if you can redirect power from lighting to the radio. We will use our personals for now, I said, and grabbed us all the flashlight from a toolbox. Ah, there we go! Gruber chirped happily as the crackle ceased. Hello, this is Aluka 13. Come on, is that you? The radio remained silent for a moment. I hung my head in despair, my whiskers buzzing. Keep trying, I commanded. Hello there, may I talk to you about your car's extended warranty? Came a loud, bloated voice of distorted Ottish, followed by a strange chuckle. Hello, this is Franz Gruber. We are in need of assistance. Our radio equipment appears to be damaged. Can you please relay our signal back to Everton Air Force Base, yeah? A spark of hope. The crew immediately perked up. Hmm, let me think. Uh, no. The voice responded, followed by one of the most sadistic laughs I have ever heard. What's the... Hey, we've the... we need help. Hello, hello. The radio crackled again and went silent. No. Oh god, another one of those crazies got access to a backwater radio signal again, I said and hung my head low with disapproval. This is Everton, Everton to Elusia 13, do you copy? The desperate voices of ground control suddenly came through and we immediately snapped to attention. 
Everton, this is Lucia 13, reading you loud and clear. Keep it short, we seem to have radio issues, I barked. The radio crackled a bit more, as if there was some nearby interference. Alu 13, we are receiving interference, there's severe trying to rep- Resignal is strange. We got you out there. The message from home was gobbled, barely coherent. In between the message, I could hear laughing. We fiddled around some more. Yeah, I can't take this. Something's out there. Maybe it's the antenna. I gotta fix it, Lorid said, and put his suit on. I need to risk it. But what choice do we have? We will all go out, except for France. While we're out there, we can repair the parachute hatches, I said, and gave the poor signal for everyone to put on their suits. So, yes, sir, came the universal reply from the crew. I waited for a moment after I had put my suit on and secured it. Then I got the OK signal from everyone. Suits on, depressurizing, tanks are filling, no leaks. We got that going at least, I said, as I watched the green gauges on oxygen tanks fill up. Depress complete, clear for EVA. No sound came from anything as the air around us vanished, replaced by the silence of space and our own breathing. A few moments passed and Lorid slipped out of the craft's airlock. A few of these moments followed. By the mothers of milk! What the fluffing hell, Captain! Captain! The Lorid nearly shattered our eardrums as his distorted, terrified screaming filled our radios. A happy, almost sadistically happy laugh came over the radios. <laughs> I was wondering when you'd do notice me. It's kind of obvious, to be honest, but God, that was totally worth it. <laughs> Laura had frantically entered the craft again and scurried back inside, shuttering the door behind him as fast as he could. He looked at me with terror in his eyes as he screamed something at me from behind his mask, but the radio had turned off and we couldn't hear it. He looked straight at me, his sniffers twitching frantically as he was desperately wheezing something from behind his helmet. I watched him as he tapped on my radio beacon to remind him of the fact. He twitched and fumbled for a moment, then crawled around looking for his access switch He found it. Oh boy, did he find it. Aliens, came his loud, ear-shattering scream. It was at this moment the room suddenly went dark like an eclipse. We went dead silent, an eerie moment of calm overtaking us. It was then the cockpit was overcome by a shadow that moved from left to right. The shadow slowly blanketed us, like a giant shadowy being was enveloping us, when suddenly... The hulking mass of refined metals and telltale structures of hangars locking mechanisms honed itself into view. Moments later, we were inside of a massive hangar. It would have fit our entire launch assembly inside it, easily. In front of us was an array of craft, the designs of which were oddly familiar, similar to our own, but significantly bulkier and very, very heavily armored. We could surmise, based on our own ship classification system, the approximate sizes and abilities of the craft that we were looking at. This thing had 50 or more small fighter craft, 30 or so bomber craft, some ships that looked fit for mining operations, and in the back of the hangar we saw warships similar in design to one of our battleships were just casually suspended from the ceiling. We had no time to take in the sight, as the pod was gently grabbed by a mechanical manipulation arm, then slowly lowered to the floor. We could clearly see whatever was here was far in advance of anything that we had. As we heard the sunk of metal, we took note of the guns, cannons, and weapons mounted on the fighters. I quickly ran a short plan through my head, an escape plan. Maybe, if whatever was in here was hostile, we could steal the ship and make it home. Maybe, do enough damage to drive them off, reverse engineer so that we could fight back. My thoughts were interrupted by the sound of our radio crackling back to life. Everton to 13, do you copy? Desperate pleading from the radio. I was barely able to comprehend what I was seeing. I stuttered and stammered as I tried to understand what in the holy milk just happened. G- g- ground controller, the, 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 this is Alku. We, we have, uh, we, we... Everton, we read you. What's the situation? The volume rose. Everton, this is Lucia 13. We have first contact. I repeat, we have first contact. I screamed in terror as the hangar door closed locking us in. The pod sunk harshly as it was clamped onto and slowly lowered to the floor. A voice came over the radio. Hangar pressurization complete. Blast door secured. We clambered to our feet as we suddenly felt the pull of gravitational force. Anything that wasn't stowed away suddenly clunked to whatever direction was down, including us. We asserted a defensive posture as I held my men back at the entrance of the pod. 
We could hear clanking of some kind as whatever owned the ship was now clawing at the pot's door. I waited for a moment. And waited. Nothing. I stopped hearing noises. Then, uh, a knock? Wait. A knock? Hello in there, anybody home? It said. The voice coming in over our radios is muffled from the outside. Her commandant, what do we do? France asked me. I simply shook my head. No, are you coming out voluntarily, or do I have to get the crowbar? Is that hatch broken or something? You are being very rude, you know. The voice said once again. I was half scared, half curious. I reached over to the hatchway and unlatched it. I took a very ginger step outside the door and saw the thing. It was two and a half times our size, six feet tall with broad shoulders, a bipedal creature covered in heavy armor plating and fabric that created a sort of armored monk robe-like appearance. Two terrifying front-facing eyes filled with bright colors of sparkling blue, just like the lakes of home as if to mock us. Two long arms with five fingers. It did not appear to have any claws or anything as its gloves were smooth, unlike ours. It was standing at a respectable distance from the pod now that I'd come out. I took a deep breath, and by mother's milk was the air fresh. I felt my senses heighten and my mind rushed with thought as I took in a deep breath of some truly amazing oxygen. It was also scented. It smelled like I was in the midst of an evergreen forest after a spring rain. I felt so relaxed. My jowls chattered curiously in response to the world around me. My crewmates, aware I was not screaming and not finding anything, wandered outside one by one. I looked up at the strange creature, who was simply smiling at me, careful not to show teeth, tapping one foot while waiting for something. I held up my paw to salute. Uh, hello? I said gingerly. Hey, what's up? Figured you needed a hand, so yeah, he simply said. Well, his mouth moved, but the words he spoke were out of sync. He must have some kind of translation system. Um, thanks, uh, we, we kind of needed it, I said, rubbing the back of my head, slightly embarrassed. Ah, nonsense, you had it handled. I figured I'd just, uh, you know, cut the middleman out, he replied, shuffling nervously. Always happy to cut out the middleman, I replied, half-jokingly. We shared an awkward chuckle together before I finally noticed my radio was barking at me. Illusion 13, come in! Illusion 13, for God's sake, come in! Uh, excuse me. I have to take this call, I said, and rumbled back into the pod to recover a handhold. Franz moved over to the side of Marvel at the engineering array in front of him. Lorette examined the creature standing in front of us more closely. Bayard took a look at the pod itself to prepare to find out what the hell even happened. This is Lucia 13, go ahead, I said. I was out of breath at this point. I had nothing to save save what needed to be said. Oh, thank the mother. Can you confirm that you have first contact? He asked. What do you mean, can you confirm exactly? I asked, a bit bewildered. Can you give us any definitive signs? We're in the dark here, came the reply. Are you fucking kidding me? This ship has to be at least a mile long. Have you tried looking out the window? I yelled out into the radio. The radio went silent, and the creature behind me held his hands up to his mouth. Clearly, he was enjoying the embarrassment show that we had just put on. I leaned against the pod and tried to calm my headache with my paw to my temple. Uh, uh, Illusion 13, this is Everton. Uh, confirm first contact. It's, uh, uh, very heavily armed, HQ said, training off. So I noticed, well, it, he, they, uh, non-hostile. Seems friendly, at least. Uh, I'm gonna go give this a shot, I said, putting the radio back. I approached the creature and stood it to attention. I tapped my left foot, brought my paw up to my temple. Captain Reginald Waters, Cassian Air Force, Space Corps, at your service. Welcome to Alaria. He slammed his feet together, left arm down at his side, right hand up to his head. Captain Lukash Lockhorn, proud owner of this fine vessel. The sirens gazed. I'm human. Uh, mostly. Mostly? Uh, he removed part of his robe on his right arm, showing extensive cybernetic augmentation. Yeah, mostly. Yeah, uh, look. I'm not a diplomat. I'm just a miner. I'm here to drill holes into rocks and make cash. I'm gonna be frank with you. I'm not qualified, or even illegally allowed to talk to you, but, uh, you were in trouble, so I had to do something, you know. So, if you don't mind, I'm gonna get you guys back home and phone this in to my bosses. Let the bigwigs handle this. That is fair enough. First contact protocol must be quite strict in your world. If I may ask a few questions, though, I asked, approaching him a bit closer. Sure, I can answer a few things, but I have to ready the shuttle well. 
It's a big goddamn ordral, but uh, you get the idea. It can go into Atmos, so yeah. He shrugged and smiled. Please go ahead. Um, can you also take the wreckage of the pod? We would much like to investigate the wreckage and find out what happened plus to the, um, uh, the re outsider. Uh, if that's not too much trouble, I asked as politely as I could. I noticed when I twitched my whiskers he seemed to like it. Oh sure, gonna need a load up and recover. Give me a sec. He moved his arm up and typed on a wearable computer. Bayard and Franz watched with awed fascination as a giant mechanical arm moved things around inside the hangar. So, uh, my first question. So long as it isn't tech or security related, I can answer anything, he said, typing on his pad, seemingly manually controlling the arm. Ah, uh, are you on your own? Why am I seeing only you on the ship? Where is the rest of your crew? I asked, perplexed. Oh, uh, well, uh, you're not the first alien species we've encountered, and, um, well, uh, my shipmates would scare the crap out of you, so they volunteered to stay out of this until we had get a proper greeting, he said, pointing at a window in the hangar above us. The hairs in the back of my head rose in terror as the smiling faces of three other creatures stared dead into my soul. A strange creature with eight legs wearing some kind of engineer's cap, a large muscular beast with a long snout and sharp teeth with short, thick brown fur, a large serpentine-like lizard using a series of mounted mechanical arms to wave at me. They waved at me with a smile, a friendly wave and a smile to be sure, but I couldn't help feeling very intimidated. Well, <laughs> that, 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 that's nice. Uh, you um, uh, make lots of very scary friends, huh? I said, chuckling nervously. Meh, every species is pretty trill, actually, except for the Boris, uh, the big brown one. Word of advice, don't let him drink too much beer. Uh, also, Solaracus Serpentai. You'll learn more about everyone eventually, but almost done. He smiled at me and started to walk to the drill ship. A complex-looking mechanism lowered it to ground level, and a ramp appeared from it so we could go in. Ah, uh, I see. Sounds like a, a fun bunch to be around. System secure, Captain. Ready to disembark on your command. Relay has already been sent to headquarters, uh, and a diplomatic frigate is on its way. A voice came from the radio unit, and it scared the shit out of me. He noticed my discomfort. Yeah, I know, the hissing takes some getting used to, but yeah, hell of a mayong player. Anyway, come hither, kind sir, thy chariot awaits. Got the pardon debris from the rest of your craft on board the cargo bay. I don't want to risk any contamination, so uh, I'll put you in isolation booth and secure myself in the cockpit. I'd recommend quarantining yourself when you get back too, you know, uh, just in case. That is a very good point. I shall do so. Uh, what happens now? I asked and moved into the craft. Its passageways were incredibly spacious. I could do a dance with my wife in these hallways with how big they were. Well, I knew where my priorities were, I suppose. Well, after I get you home, we're going to do a full decontamination thing. Make sure that we don't get anyone sick. Then after dropping the cargo off, and of course you, I'm going to head back into space. Then my crew and I shall patrol the system until the real diplomats arrive. In the meantime, uh, here. Just before we entered the ship, he handed me a computer drive of some kind. Oh, well, thanks. Uh, what is it? I asked as I gripped it. It was a bit heavy. Archives, basic stuff, histories, language, database, technical schematics for translators, and the programming to actually use them. Lots of stuff. Should keep you occupied until we can start going through the official diplomatic channels, and, uh, I included a little something in there. Don't tell anyone, he said, giving me a wink as he ushered me into our cabin. Mein Gott, feel the leather on these seats. Franz was a happy boy settling into his chair. Beard was too occupied looking around at all the electronics around him. Siren's gaze, siren's gaze, priority alert received. This is Captain Call of the Sinner's Refuge. We are entering system T-10. A radio message broke out. Call me that, Sinner's Refuge. We are currently in first contact procedures. Please maintain your distance and stay on standby. CENTCOM has already been briefed, Lukash replied, and a third told us that we had been released from the clamps. Byard and friends were beside themselves as the ship that we were in glided effortlessly down to the planet's surface, without even encountering air resistance. I couldn't wait to see home again. Lorit was busy with the notepad, frantically writing down everything he could see, making observations about how the walls were built. As for me, well, I just couldn't wait to go home.
Several months later, after this incident took place, we finally got in contact with the Terran Union. We were not yet allowed any real form of starship technology, with the humans setting up serious restrictions on uplifting policy. But they did get us some much-needed energy and resource tech, and in exchange for some local goods, Lukash, the human that we'd first encountered, agreed to mine some much-needed minerals for us. Humanity wanted us to reach the stars under our own power before they gave us anything real to work with. Within that time, the Terrans set up a dedicated ambassador operation by building a small outpost on our largest moon, and the taxi service needed to actually use it. Seven more human warships appeared in the system and acted as a defense fleet until we could get our own military force in place. That'll be decades down the line. It's good to know that we have someone that we can rely on long term. In any case, I've taken up enough of your time. See you in the void, friend. End of story. I would just quickly like to thank the T5 peeps, Dragon Soup, Cold War Boomer Waffen, Severin Cerberus, Red Panda 121, Leslie 517, Bushmaster 177, Casper Arnholtz, Cam Maxwell, Sans the Skeleton, Lightjock, Dragzoon WRE, and Lord Azricol. Thank you very much.